This is Clayton Howe's Entertainment X. For this episode, I chat with Mark Turtletob, and we cover a little bit of everything from kindness to how he's gotten better at listening um, to producing and creating the science fiction comedy Jewels, which I highly recommend everyone go see, and Carpe Diem, and so much more. So I hope you enjoy this episode with Mark Turtletob. We're back. I'm Clayton Howe, and today with me on the beautiful Orcas Island at the Orcas Island Film Festival, Mark Turtletob. Mark, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Good morning. We were talking briefly before we started about how absolutely stunning this island is. Yeah, it's a special place. Uh, With special people. Really good humans out here. Uh, people you've, who get you've it. met the right ones. I guess so. <laughs> but it's like people who really get what matters, which is just like enjoying what exists. Yeah, it's hard to be <laughs> stressful uh, when you're, uh, unfortunately, your, your listeners can't see what we're looking at, but we're looking out at the at the sound and the waves are coming in and there's there's a little island out in the middle of, uh, I don't know, about 100 yards out and the waves are coming in around that island. So it's pretty hard to be stressed out when that's your view. With the seals having breakfast. With the seals, right. <laughs> Before we get to Jules, the film you're working on here at the festival and and so much more, I want to take it back to the beginning of time for you. What were your entertainment dreams growing up? That's an interesting question. I, I didn't have entertainment dreams growing up. Uh, I, I talked to a lot of young folks uh, about what should I be doing with my life and how do I know what I want to do? And there are a rare few who know right from an early age what their passion is. You think about a guy like Steven Spielberg and you, you hear his life story and he kind of knew he was going to be a director from the first, from the first day. Uh, for me, it was, I think the closest thing I got was I always loved uh, literature and I, uh, at an early, relatively early age, I began uh, writing a newsletter for the neighborhood, which uh, I think I was charging a nickel, but I ended up giving away. Uh, and that was as close as you could say were my entertainment dreams. I thought I might, uh, I might, uh, I didn't even think about it, but I just found myself writing early on. And years later, I did become a journalist. What did your parents teach you about work ethic growing up? You know, they don't teach you those things you don't learn uh, verbally. You learn by observing them, obviously, Clay. Uh, and I got to see uh, my father in particular uh, working crazy hours. Uh, and he was one of uh, 11 children. There were two families. Uh, his, uh, his father's first wife passed away. Uh, and I was, he was the, the, one of the children of the second wife. So there was 11 kids, yeah. uh, and they were poor, uh, and his father was a, a, a blacksmith, a furrier, uh, who came to America uh, around the time uh, that Henry Ford was uh, doing his thing, and so blacksmiths weren't uh, going to be so much in demand to, to make horseshoes anymore. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, and, and my grandfather, who I never knew, apparently wasn't a very good businessman, but he kept trying to start little businesses. And my father turned out to be the fair-haired boy of the, of the family. And he, at an early age, began working uh, uh, to raise money for the family. He used to set up uh, bowling pins, as I, I know the story, uh, for a couple of pennies a game when there were no automated uh, uh, machines to set up the pins. Yeah. So that's the kind of father I had. And then through the, and that was at, I think at nine, he was doing that or seven. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I got to see him uh, all through the years working uh, really, uh, really crazy hours. Uh, and it was just uh, part of, uh, part of the environment that I grew up in. So that's how, that's how I saw it. Uh, they were a, they were a family from the for me uh, the in the fifties. They were a family that although <laughs> they were struggling, he my mother wouldn't work. He wouldn't let my mother work. I think you know they you know today obviously it'd be a two both of them would have worked. Uh, so he worked doubly hard to support the family, and I just got to see that. S similar question: What your parents taught you about kindness growing up? Uh, 
I, I think I got reinforced largely by my mother. I just gave my father lots of credit, uh, but my mother uh, was uh, very much involved in, in nonprofit work. And so I got to see that, and I got to see her kindness. Later on, when they had made some money uh, in her, gee, I would guess she was in her f- 60s, uh, she was able to hire a woman to come in and clean once a week her house. Huh. Uh, and uh, what I remember is my mother getting down on the floor with this woman because she wouldn't let her clean the bathroom. My mother would get on her knees and clean the pipes behind the toilet herself and say, no, 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 you go in, I made you a lunch. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, she w- they were, you know, that was sort of the background, but she, she had a great sense of social responsibility beyond that. Yeah. And growing up, did you have any particular mentors in business or any standout lessons? No, not uh, not really. I just got you inhale when you're, you know, my father was a good businessman. He was very creative and you just sort of inhale it because you hear the conversation. So I think that would be the the person that I took the most from without realizing I was taking it in. And then in terms of communication, I think it's so important. People who are great at communication <laughs> can go very far in life. Through this journalist background and then being the CEO of the, the money store, how did you get better at leadership but communication? You know, that's, I, think, uh, I think it came fairly uh, naturally to me, and, and maybe it was just the family that I grew up in which encouraged conversation. Mm. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure that I became better at communicating. It wasn't that I was uh, completely secure talking in front of a group, Mm -hmm. but it happened pretty quickly that I could get up in front of large groups and speak speak with confidence. I think it was, I think I sort of came in that way. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it just, well, yeah, it just kind of, for some, it can just happen. Many people are not very good at it. But right, the ones who but you do can it, cultivate it. Uh, you can cultivate it. And I think there's always, there's always situations for all of us, right, which are difficult. And uh, when you confront those situations, Clay, and you get past them, you go, oh, that wasn't so bad. It's all about not being in the moment, I guess, and projecting, uh, projecting how, what's going to happen if it goes wrong. And and so I think uh, the more you do it, the more uh, at ease you become. Yeah. Yeah. And I find myself repeating a year from now, this won't matter. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it puts everything in perspective. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, I have, uh, I have a friend, a screenwriter who, uh, who gets messages. He's, he's, he doesn't, he's not this morose, although it sounds like he gets messages about, uh, about death, uh, three times a day on his cell phone. Uh, and God know, uh, you know, <laughs> and I won't identify him, but uh, I've, I've worked with him uh, a couple of times now. And he said, yeah, it just reminds me uh, that all this stuff doesn't really matter. I say that a lot. It's so true, though. And it puts it all in perspective right? in life. And in, well, particularly because I want to get deeper into this entertainment film and your journey to Jules. Prior to that, though, I'm curious, how have you gotten better at asking questions? I think I was always good at asking questions. Again, uh, that came easier. It was harder for me to, frankly, to listen well. Uh, it was, I felt very comfortable asking, that's why I was easily gravitated into journalism and why I was writing a newsletter for the neighborhood at nine yeah. uh, or seven. Uh, but uh, it was more difficult to really listen and to be a good listener. And that took, uh, that's taken, th- there's an art to that. And this film that we uh, just made and is, uh, is released is really about listening. Mm-hmm. And it's about how a creature from another place who doesn't have a voice allows three people, uh, three old people who, uh, to find their voice. And it's because that, that alien is a perfect listener. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think for me, it was a journey to being a better listener. What was, what was the connective tissue for you to this film? How did, it, how did you find the story, or how did the story find you? Uh, it came to me, it was already a screenplay, uh, and uh, it came to me through uh, another producer who sent it uh, to me thinking I might like it. 
I read it and was immediately taken with it because it's uh, sui generis, one of a kind. Mm. And I, kn I knew that there wouldn't be another movie like this uh, in the next 10 years. Uh, be, it, the blend of talking about something serious, talking about aging and losing one's faculties, mm. uh, talking about how people uh, of a certain age become invisible, those were interesting subjects to me. Yeah. Uh, I got to see my father, although he didn't uh, have dementia. I got to see him slowly and my mother losing their faculties. Uh, and so that was an emotional connection for me. Uh, and, and I knew for many people. And at the same time, it didn't do it in a heavy-handed or uh, morose way. Mm. It did it with enormous humor, uh, with inventiveness, with a science fiction element. And it also had a buddy element. And those things don't usually go together. Yeah. Uh, three old people in a buddy movie, uh, a science, f a four foot 11 inch alien, uh, a story about aging and losing one's faculties, uh, about being lit. Those things don't go together. Mm -hmm. uh, and it did it in such a beautiful way with so much wild humor that I, when I read it, I knew I had to do it. I didn't know if I could pull it off, but I knew I had to try. Well, the book is so good. I mean, the screenplay is so good. Yeah. And some of the, the best, I mean, this personal taste is when I'm thoroughly entertained, which I was, You're right. but then educated. Yeah. But you don't really catch that. Yeah. You, know? you don't want to wear it on your sleeve. Right. Yeah. And I think that's just so fantastic. Yeah. And it, it seems many of the projects you work on are so, you are so invested in them personally. You care, you care uh -huh. about each, each project. Is that just who you are? Or had that, is that a journey within? I think it's a journey. I, you know, I didn't come to filmmaking until I began producing in my 50s. I began directing much later into my 60s. Right. So I'm very late to the game. Uh, and I've only done a few films. Right. Uh, so I think if I had made films in my 30s, uh, it, they would have been very different films. I think your your interests and your sophistication and your your uh, just your, your your life experience uh, changes uh, as we get older, and so it, it, it you know I can't I'm not going to do something that I'm not really passionate about, uh, and I'm not sure I would have said that in my 30s. Mm. You mentioned you know when when you first came to this story, you weren't sure how or if you're going to be able to pull it off. I'm curious. Right. How do, you, how do you find the balance in your life between letting things happen and making things happen? Well, in turn, that's a great question. It, it's two, two parts. How do you do that on the outside of film and how do you do that on the inside of film? On the, <laughs> on the inside of this film, uh, it took 10 and a half months to edit it, which is ridiculously long. And I had the luxury of being able to do that. And then more, more importantly, I had the advantage of uh, two great editors working with me. Yeah. Uh, and it took that long to find the film. And it was about having a tone that could encompass all those things we just talked about. Mm. Uh, in terms of how do you find that work-life balance, uh, I'm not always perfect at it, like all of us. Uh, it's easy to slip into uh, just being obsessed with your work. Even if you're not working, you're thinking about it or you're talking about it. Yeah. It's, so it's really important to have a family that can remind you, to, you know, there's other things in life that are far more important. Right. Like this view. <laughs> I and can't like get what's over going it. on right now in the world. I mean, we're, you know, we're yeah. in such a heavy time in the world uh, that it just puts everything into perspective. Yeah. Is there a particular project that has taught you the most about yourself? I don't think there's any one. I think that for me, I have a tendency to, you know, I think each of us have certain lessons that we all need to learn. And for me, one of them is uh, that I tend to grasp uh, things or grab at things. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and, and so sometimes uh, that will mean I'm not listening to the signs around me. Uh, just this very morning, I let go of a project that I thought was gonna be my next uh, directing project. And it's because I, I finally listened to the signs that things were not lining up. Uh, there were too many obstacles. Uh, and so I think that's come over time that I realized there's another project. <laughs> there's another situation. Uh, there's another 
uh, life partner, hopefully, if that's what, what uh, we're talking about, or another yeah. uh, a bit of work uh, if you're just patient uh, and listening to the signs. And so I think that, for me, has happened gradually over the course of my life. It's amazing how easily things can come together when you're aligned. There's no effort. <laughs> when <they're>, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I, when it's right. <laughs> yeah, and I actually have two projects, and the second project is just moving seamlessly. And so... Yeah. I uh, had, had a great conversation last night about this, woke up this morning and said, yeah, it's time to let the one go and to pick up the other one. How has your taste evolved in what you work on or maybe the people you work with within film? I'm not sure my taste has evolved. I think, I, I, I think my taste was probably always there because I was always a reader and I always love good stories. Uh, I think I learned a craft, but that's not taste. Mm. I learned my craft and I'm continue to learn my craft over time. Mm. Uh, I think, uh, I think what has evolved is my ability to know, uh, who to work with. Uh, and I think that's happened over time as well. Mm. Uh, but my taste, I think, you know, it's sort of like some people have an eye. Mm. You either have an eye or you don't. I think I, I think I always had a taste. The first screenplay that I bought and thought I would make was Little Miss Sunshine. Mm. And so that was right out of the box. So I don't know that my taste evolved. And I think back on the great writers that I've liked. I mean, those in high school, we, you know, those, those certain writers just immediately uh, interested me. And I think I always had, had, that was part of who I am. Yeah. Yeah. And all of the, and I've noticed this too, especially all the projects that you've worked on, there's, nothing contrived about them. They are so incredibly genuine. Oh, well, the stories. I'm, I'm glad you feel that way. Thank you. And entertaining. You. No, yeah. seriously. Yeah. Thank you. Um, books, favorite books. Do any come to mind? Uh, you know, at different stages of my life, there have been different books. Uh, and you, I, you know, here's a spoiler alert. Clay <laughs> told me he was going to ask me this question. So I actually thought about it. Uh, and that is, uh, when I was uh, young, uh, they were, it were different books. When I was in high school, they were the transcendentalists, you know, uh, Emerson and Thoreau, uh, and, uh, and then, uh, later on Whitman, uh, and then later on, uh, at different stages of my life, I remember falling in love with, uh, Ken Kesey and sometimes a great notion. Although the other, his other novel became the great, the great uh, movie, uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I remember loving uh, sometimes a great notion. Uh, I went through periods of loving science fiction and E. Van Vo and uh, uh, and writers like that. I went, th- you know, just different stages. I remember uh, Herman Hesse in my in my twenties and uh, Thomas Mann and just different writers throughout all the years. Uh, so it's really hard to say is there is there one mm. uh, that I remember loving uh, Gunter Grass for a while and. Uh, uh, and then more recently, uh, there's a, you know, I, all I, now it's, I become spoiled. All I seem to do is read, looking for a, looking for my next project. Uh, so it, it your, your, um, your eye changes, uh, yeah. somewhat, but, uh, there's a, there's a book called Hamnet, H-A-M-N-E-T, that was lovely. There's a number of, uh, of, of writers that I've, I've come to appreciate. I love Ann Patchett. Uh, there's a bunch of writers that I like. When you're not working on films, what do you do? What's your, how do you wind down? Uh, I love, well, you see where we live. Uh, it's, in, <laughs> uh, it's in nature. I have two labs. I love uh, taking uh, short hikes with my labs. I love swimming. Uh, I still shoot, uh, play a little basketball, not competitively, but uh, love, to, love to shoot baskets. So uh, those are the things, and, and reading, or those are the things, and hanging out with family and, and friends. Metaphorically speaking, if you could put a word or a phrase on a billboard for millions of people to mm. see, does anything come to mind? A word on the billboard. You know, I was telling somebody the other day, you know, I want to get a, a, a screen, I, I want to infuse a screenplay with what was in Dead Poets Society, which was that wonderful phrase, carpe diem, mm-hmm. seize the day. 
uh, and maybe that's maybe that would be the one. I didn't come up with it, uh, but uh, <laughs> I remember the impact that that phrase had in the movie Dead Poets Society. And I said, I want to find a contemporary message like that uh, that we can uh, somehow or other uh, infuse uh, in a story. But I think Clay, at the end of the day, it's not the not necessarily the words, but it's the it's the overall story and the images that touch people. Uh, and that's what's so magical about making movies. It's not just the words, although the screenplay for Jules is wonderful. Mm. It's the performances. You know, I was, I'm so fortunate. You know, people give directors so much credit, and they don't realize, you know, how fortunate we are to have 100 people that are really good at what they do. And I know a little bit about costumes and a little bit, very little about makeup mm. and a little bit about cinematography and a little bit about, but there's some people around me who know a whole lot and the job of the director is curating and saying, okay, show me three different ideas you might have and you go, oh, that's an interesting one and no, 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 yes. Yeah. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a, you know, it's a real, I've been very fortunate to have, uh, to be surrounded by really talented people. It makes your job a lot easier. It really does. It reminds me of the um, quote, I didn't make this up, that you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. <laughs> and I think that's so true about directing and yeah. creating films. It yeah, is the average of that entire... Surround world. yourself with, with quality people. There's that great story. I think it was... Uh, try to remember who the director was that, that said it. I think it, uh, I'll, it'll come to me in a moment. But it's this great story. Oh, I know. It's Ernst Lubitsch. Uh, and you may have heard it. Uh, but, you know, he had a thing called the Lubitsch Touch. And everyone said, you know, what is it that make your movie so great, Mr. Lubitsch? And he would never answer. <laughs> and finally, there was an interview in which uh, I got to see, I forget if it was with Dick Cavett or who he did it with. Maybe that was before Cavett's time. But he, he said, you know, oh, yeah, I think it was someone who had knew, known Lubitsch and talked to Cavett. And he said... You know, I'm going to tell you the secret to the Lubitsch touch, what makes my movies all work. He says, first, you have to get the best screenwriter you can possibly find and get an amazing screenplay. Mm. He said, then find the world's finest actors, and they may not be in the United States. Go anywhere to find them. Find a brilliant cinematographer who can interpret the words on the page. Find a great production designer and a great a costume person, and then he says, you get them all in a room, and you get out of the way. And that's the secret to the Lubitsch touch. I love that. You just let, yeah, let them do it. <laughs> Mark, this conversation is fantastic. I'm so glad we got to, thank you for taking the time. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you, Clay. Is there anything else you want to add before we wrap it up? Anything no, you're looking forward you, to? Or if, uh, if your listeners get a chance to watch Jules, uh, it's a I think it's a pretty special movie, uh, and if you find that you uh, that you really love the movie, spread the word. These independent movies uh, live or die based on word of mouth, and now it's online. Uh, it's being streamed. So uh, if you get to see Jules, uh, please spread the word. People of the world, Mark Turtletown. <laughs> You've been listening to Entertainment X, the podcast. You can follow Entertainment X on Instagram at underscore Entertainment X underscore. If you haven't yet, go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Join Clay next week for another curiosity conversation on Entertainment X. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening.